I was studying in the, in the Gospel of John, and uh, one thing, a term that kept coming up to my attention was the term believe. It's actually used over 90 times, or some variation of believe in the Gospel of John. And uh, so, and the Lord Jesus himself spoke that word over 50 times in, in, that, in that Gospel. So the conclusion I drew was that it's important to the Son of God that human beings believe. So uh, what exactly are we believe and why is the question I hope to answer today or communicate through this message. So uh, in that, also strangely enough, if you look at the uh, concordance, the, the same exact word is used every time for believe. It's, it's uh, the word pistuo, which is uh, 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 number 4100, if you happen to have your concordance handy. Uh, it's, it means to be persuaded, to place your confidence in, to rely upon, and this is exclusively how it's used in the Gospel of John. Sometimes the emphasis is on, be, on being persuaded, sometimes it's more on where your confidence is, and sometimes it is commitment of trust. All right, so uh, the, the definition in the English uh, dictionary that, that we you know, prefer to use is to credit upon authority or testimony of another, to be, be persuaded by, of the truth or of something upon the declaration of another or upon evidence fur furnished by reasons, arguments, and deductions of the mind or by other circumstances than personal knowledge. When we believe upon the authority of another, we always put confidence in for his veracity, which means truth. When we believe upon the authority of reasoning or arguments, concurrence of facts and circumstances, we rest our conclusion upon their strength or probability. So we're in the first camp here. We're, we're, we're believing upon the authority of Jesus Christ on what he has said. That is, that is our position as, 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 as those who have committed trust in Jesus Christ. Let's just take a moment to pray here. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us the word of truth, that you, you have sent your Son into the world as one that we can lay a hold of by faith, who's, who's, who spoke to us, who communicated your words and your will, who brought us to a place where we could believe upon God and have the benefits of those that believe. All right. So as a result of this reading and, and the call, Lord's call, I, I discern that there's a kind of a process to believing. And the first <clears throat> is that information is acquired, okay? So, so, that, so information has to be, to be obtained to believe anything. And in our circumstances in the world, we may get false information, correct? Inf information may come to us that is not true, all right? So, um, but yeah, that's why God has given us the scripture because we know that what we have from the scripture is, is absolute truth. And the next there needs to be a process by which information is evaluated. So we, we take information in and, and, we, and we evaluate it. Now we may evaluate what God speaks to us correctly or incorrectly, all right? So uh, there's, there's a process to evaluate the truth we receive. And the result of that would be belief or unbelief, all right? And why this is important is because what we believe is going to affect our conduct our communication, and ultimately our destiny as far as the scripture is concerned. So it is important what we believe because our destiny is at stake. So this is why it was important to the Lord Jesus Christ what we believe because what we believe affects where we, where we will spend eternity. So our beliefs can be either true or false based on the truthfulness of the information provided or the way that we process information. So there, there, there's, a, you know, there's, there's a way, you know, our, our thinking needs to be changed as well as, our, as, you know, as, as the information we receive in order to come to, to a place of truth. Uh, so the Lord, when the Lord came into the world, when he was incarnated, um, he brought an opportunity for us to believe in, in a way that imparts hope. Now in the Old Testament, of course, there was hope given, but the hope given was that there would come uh, a greater prophet, a savior, a messiah that, that the Old Testament spoke of and that, that, uh, you know, that, that the, uh, the, the Jewish people, Israelites of old, were given an opportunity to look forward to. But I want to call your attention to two verses we have in the New Testament. Uh, the first is Romans uh, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So there was hope for Israel and hope for humanity. And hope is important to us, right? We, we need hope. We need a cause for hope, right? And a lot of the hopes that the world would furnish, of course, are, are, are as short-lived as the world itself is. 
So, so we have a hope that transcends time and space because, because we have, we have the, our hope comes from God. And 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 21 tells us this, Who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So hope that is directed toward God as the, is the, is, is, as the only one that can be trusted or hoped in without disappointment. So we, are, we often become cynical, right, when our hopes are disappointed in the world. But we should never have, cynicism should never be an attribute of the Christian. If, if, we're, if our hope is in God, then, 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 our, then, then our hope is sustain, sustainable, all right? So um, <clears throat> the next question, so, so I, I was looking at these verses, and I kind of looked at them and said, how do we... Uh, how do we how do we understand these verses? I'm not going to just for information. I'm not going to cite all 90 verses in my message today, so uh, so we won't be here that long. All right. The first thing is how do we understand the Lord's direction and His expectation when He used the term believe, and what exactly is it to be believed? And first, I want to take you to um, John chapter 5, verses 20, verse 24. He says, verily, 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 I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. So believing starts again with listening. All right. So, so that, that has to be the first step. And many of us never hear his words. Okay. Uh, and I refer you to the parable of the soils in Mark chapter 4. There's a soil called the wayside soil, right? That is a hard soil. It's, it's like a pathway. And the sower sows the seed, and that seed falls on that hard soil. And what happens? Right away, Satan comes and he snatches that seed up. So that, that hard soil is the person who can hear. And if you've gone, if, if you've done, as, as Ray mentioned, if you've done some door knocking, some evangelism, you run into that, okay? You run into people who cannot hear, who will not hear, excuse me, all right? Um, so if there's not going to be any hearing, there's not going to be any believing. Uh, the Lord wor warned us in, in Luke's gospel in, in chapter 8, he said, Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Who, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken that which he seemeth to have. So hearing is a discipline that must be practiced for we adults as well as the children. So all you parents, you're eager for your children to hear and to continue to hear. But sometimes we adults, we're pretty bad at it too, aren't we? Uh, especially when it comes to the word of God. So, um, so um, and, and you understand there's a, there's a principle of the Lord communicated here. If we don't hear and continue to hear, what little we have will be taken from us. So hearing has to be a discipline that, that we, particularly with the word of God, keep in place, okay, that we continue to hear. We don't, we don't reach a point where we say, I've got this, I, I know enough, I can, I, I can hold this, because that's a short way of losing the truth you have, is to, stop, is to stop hearing what God has for us. So the next point I want to make is from uh, John chapter 5 also, verses 46 and 47. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So, so the Lord, of course, is speaking to Jewish people who uh, had, had this, had in their synagogues, they had the revelation of God. And we call that, of course, supernatural revelation. They had revelation from God that other people did not have. Um, they had been taught in their synagogues, but they were not persuaded by what they heard concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not, they did not hear those words the way God intended them. And therefore, they, they did not come to a place where they could, they could believe in Jesus Christ. So believing requires, <coughs> excuse me, a framework in which to receive truth. So truth is communicated, if you recall, in the, God, in the book of Acts, um, Truth was communicated by Peter to, to Jewish, Jewish people in chapters 2 and 3. And it is a very different introduction to the gospel than you have in Acts chapter 17, where the apostle Paul is teaching, is, is ministering the gospel to, to uh, non-Jews, to, to, uh, to Greek people. Okay? So, and this is a respect for, for their respective frame, frames of reference. So they reach coming from the, the Jews had, had the law, of course, they had the revelation of God, so, so that didn't need to be covered, whereas for the, for the Gentiles, they needed to know that as God is creator. They needed to know him as the one who sustains all things before they could understand the gospel of Jesus Christ directly. 
So we all have a framework in which we believe, okay, in which we process information. And, uh, and we need, that framework needs to be the scriptures, okay, to, to, in order to successfully process information. So, um, so that was important, and it was a real hindrance to not have that, despite having had that information, to have not taken it to heart and mind for the Jewish people of the Lord's time. The next thing that, that the Lord's expectation was is that he, in, in, in John chapter 8, he said, which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why don't you believe me? All right, so, so they had a testimony of his conduct. Uh, they could not find fault with him. They tried to find fault with him, but they could not find fault with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so the next question was, if I'm speaking, to, if I'm doing truth, if, if, my, if, if what I do is right and good, why don't you believe my words? Um, so Jesus established his credibility to speak, to, to call them to believe by means of his conduct. All right, so most of us, you know, you're out of the world and you see a lot of people demanding your attention, but they don't have the conduct that, that backs up that call, right? So their, their personal credibility is, is lacking and therefore, we do well to, to not take those people at face value because, again, because, because their own lives don't back up what they call us to believe, all right? And the last thing is that in John chapter uh, 10, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So the Lord had miraculous works. They were beneficial works. They were delivering works, right, from sickness, from de demonic possession. Um, they were, they were, um, they, human beings were liber liberated from things that were controlling them, that were, were binding them, all right? Uh, so belief requires evidence to substantiate uh, what one is called to believe. And Jesus Christ provided evidence that he was to be believed by his works, okay? So his works were a testimony his, word, his conduct was a testimony. The, script, the Old Testament scriptures were a testimony to him. And, and, his, and the words that he spoke, of course, were, 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 were a testimony. So, so, um, so we have, by him, we have this you know, call, to, call to, be, to believe in him. So, so the next question is, <clears throat> there is a call to believe, and there's a statement of what to, is to be believed. In uh, John 6, chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, uh, the, the, he had fed these people, and they had followed him, right? He had fed a large number of people, thousands of people, and they, and they followed him. And, of course, Jesus said, you're following me. Why? Because, because you want to be fed. You want your, your stomachs to be full. And, and so um, and the question got around to, to, to what works would satisfy God. And they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he have sent. Now, this is a real trigger, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, that word, the word work, because a lot of people say there are no works to salvation, but yet the Lord used that term work as a contrast for believe. So, so what can we say about belief as a work? The first thing is belief is not passive, okay? Belief is intentional. So, to, so I want to say, if I may, that belief is a work in that it's something that you decide to do. It is not something that comes upon you, but it's, it is a choice you make. Uh, belief is not a work in that it's not imposed upon by God upon anybody. Nobody is demanded of God to believe. God gives an opportunity to believe, but he does not, sum, but he does not, he does not compel people to believe him at this time. All right. The next thing is that, so, so the first thing is that, that there, there is this call to believe, okay, to believe on him whom he, whom he has sent, all right? So Jesus is the one that God has sent into the world. And the next thing in John 8, 24, Jesus said, <clears throat> I say therefore unto you, thank you, James, <clears throat> that if you die in your sins, you will die in your sins if you believe not that I am he, that you will die, die in your sins. And, and the, the, the critical words there are I am. So Jesus identified himself in this passage as the I am of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the way God identified himself to the people in, you know, in Moses' time, you know, for, to Moses and Israel. So he was the God who interceded on behalf of Israel as they were slaves in um, Egypt. And he is the God who heard the cry of his people and he was aware of their need, and he had, moreover, he had the strength, the wherewithal, to deliver them from their bondage. 
So Jesus Christ is not just a unique character in history. He is God. He is that Old Testament God that is mighty to deliver his people and save. So he called us to believe in him as that, all right? So um, he furthermore, he identified himself <coughs> um, as, as the son of God when he healed the man who had been blind from birth. And he healed this man, and this man really found himself in the, in the center of a storm of controversy. He was being challenged, and his parents were being challenged because they said, he, he, there's no way he could have been born blind, right? So, so the Lord came to him after, his, after, he, he, had, um, after he had healed him after, and after he had been subject to this interrogation by, by the scribes and Pharisees. And, he, and Jesus heard, they had cast him out of the synagogue, and Jesus had heard this. And when he found him, he said unto this man, do you believe on the Son of God? All right, so that was his question to him. And this man had what I think is a really compelling answer. And he simply said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe upon him? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and, taught, and he is he that talketh with thee. So Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what did that mean to the Jews of that time, that Jesus was the Son of God? So I would uh, point you to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, for unto us a child is born, <clears throat> excuse me, unto us a son is given, and government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So that was what he, that's how Jesus was identifying himself, as that prophetic son of God. In Luke chapter 1, we read, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the, high, of the highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. So we also know that Jesus Christ is the heir of all things to the Son of God. He is the one to whom God has committed all creation and all judgment. So, so he is, you know, we understand him to be not just, not just a, again, a person um, who appeared on the earth, but as, as God himself come in the flesh. So that is one thing Jesus called us to believe, is that he is the Son of God. Again, he called him to believe that he is the I Am of the Old Testament, and he called us to believe that he is the one that God has sent. All right. The next thing he asked them to believe was that he was in the Father, and the Father was in him. And Ray, Ray alluded to some of these verses in his teaching this morning. He says uh, <clears throat> in, in John chapter 10, verse 38, um, But if I do, <clears throat> though you believe me, do you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. So uh, there's a unique relationship between the Father and the Son. So Jesus Christ is on the earth, he's in a body, but he's still one with the Father. You know, that hasn't changed. On the cross, of course, he was separated from his Father for that period of time, for that time of suffering, that he might be identified with us. But in his walk upon the earth, uh, he, was, he was always present with the Father, and the Father was always present with him. And we're called in mind, we're called to that same type of relationship in John chapter 15. That although Jesus Christ is not on the earth, we have that same privilege to walk with him in that ready fellowship and presence as we yield to the Holy Spirit. It is something that most of us never attain to, but that's, the, that's what you, know, you might call the normal Christian life, is Christ in us and we in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the life that Christ lived. He didn't live of his own, he, he, he said that you know, he lived by the will of the Father, by the power of the Father. Even though he was almighty, he trusted himself to God and he lived by the power of God. He, he emptied himself of that power to, to, so that the power of God could be in him. <clears throat> All right, so um, the next thing is that, is uh, after when, uh, when Lazarus had died, of course, uh, Jesus, took a period of time before he came uh, to be present um, at, at the funeral. And of course, the sisters, Martha and Mary, were very disappointed. And, and Jesus uses an opportunity to challenge them regarding who he is. And Mar Martha said unto him, um, he challenged him about the resurrection. So Martha had an expectation of a resurrection for her, her brother, but of course not at that time, not, not at that place. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So we are called to believe that, that Jesus, it, he himself is, not only does he not he possess, but he is himself resurrection power. And he, he is himself absolute life. All right. 
So if we have this belief in Christ, we can overcome all disappointments in this life because we know that there is a life after this life. There's a resurrection unto eternal life for those who believe in Jesus Christ. That is the privilege we have as believers, and that is what Jesus, because that is who Jesus Christ is. He is resurrection life, all right? Uh, and resurrection, so that's every true believer's help is, is that there will be a resurrection unto eternal life. And, uh, and that life that Jesus Christ is, that, that we have by virtue of being united to him, is a life that has no limitations. It has no expiration date on it. It has no exhaustion. All right? It's a life that abounds forever. So, so that, that, is, that is what we're called to believe in when we believe in Jesus Christ, that he not only he has something to communicate to us by virtue of us being united to him in faith. All right. The um, so <clears throat> so it also he in, in John chapter eleven also in that passage uh, when it says in John eleven uh, forty one they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said Father I thank thee that thou hast heard me and I knew that thou hearest me always but because of the people which stand by I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So again, Jesus is the one sent by God, all right? So we are called to believe in him as such. He, he doesn't come of his own volition. He doesn't come being sent by a party or by a religion. He comes as one who is, who is sent by God. And he represents the interest of, and he's here to, he was there to fulfill the purpose of God, all right? I'm always reminded, one of the passages that has always impacted me is in the Old Testament, Abraham had the steward, he's not named, but he sent his steward out of the country, right, to, to find a wife for his, his son Isaac. And this, this servant was so admirably intentional about his purposes. He wouldn't be dissuaded. He, wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he didn't want to be fed. He didn't want anything from, from uh, uh, Rebecca's family uh, because, until he had accomplished his purpose. So, so he, you know, he was, and the Lord Jesus Christ is, the, is that kind of steward. He was very intentional, as you read in the Gospels, about his purpose. And he was very prompt to remind his disciples of why he came. And he never deterred from that. He never, he never initiated anything on his own to his own purpose. He walked the path that his father had for him, and he walked it to the cross and to, to death, suffering and death and then resurrection unto life. All right, so, so Jesus is the one, as that sent one, he is that perfect servant of God, the perfect steward of God uh, that, 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 that is capable and competent and trustworthy to accomplish the purposes of God concerning each of us. All right, in, uh, in John chapter 12, verses uh, 35 and 36, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Now Jesus doesn't hide himself from us, right? He is willing and able to provide light to us. Um, these people were skeptical of him, um, and he called them to believe in him as, as light, um, as illumination, as revelation. Um, so darkness um, it represents, of course, ignorance. And the darkness that is spiritual is dangerous darkness, okay? Because it, it leads to destruction. So, uh, uh, so the, the God, Jesus comes uh, to bring to, to deliver us from ignorance of God, um, and only He can remedy this. Only He can bring the revelation that is outside of our experience, outside of this world, that we can have God. You know, religion takes what it can out of the world, and it seeks to communicate what is what is um, what is supernatural. Whereas God comes out and he, he communicates what's supernatural to us and he, and, he, and he brings it into the world. He brings what's outside inside and we call that supernatural revelation. And the Lord brings that to us that we might, that we might have that illumination. So we have the privilege now of illumination in our day and time, in our, in our circumstances. We can have light and we ought, to, we ought to continue in that light as he commanded these to continue in the light. So we have a choice to make you know, between darkness and light. And you're all aware there's a lot of darkness out there now. I think even, it's interesting, even people who don't believe in Christ are aware of darkness, that darkness is almost, at this point, suffocating in the culture. But we, have, we don't need to abide as believers in Christ in, in, the, in that darkness. We can, we can abide in the light, and of course we can, by the grace of God, share that light with other human beings so that, so that they're not in the darkness. Uh, <clears throat> 
So next thing I want to talk about is what are some of the things that hinder belief in Christ? All right, so, so you might have some thoughts in your mind, but I want to give you what, what this gospel tells us hinders belief in Christ. First of all, Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he said, we speak that we do know and we testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So the first impediment to belief is a refusal to believe plain truth. Now Jesus spoke a lot of spiritual truths, but he spoke a lot of plain truths. He used the parables, of course, to take a plain truth, which would be commonly acknowledged, and then to build upon that and communicate a spiritual truth. All right. So, but but his so so he he was able to use things that were relatable to his hearers um, to do that. But many refused to accept what he said on that basis, even. So, so that refusal, of course, is is a stubbornness. You know, they, they didn't want to start with truth. They didn't want to start with the truth they had in order to get truth that they could that they that, that they couldn't otherwise get. So, so that's an impediment to belief when we won't take when we won't accept the truth, the plain truth that is in front of us. And before you know, we think, well, that I wouldn't do that. We do do that. Okay, we're we're well capable of of denying plain truth. All right. It takes. It, you know, we have. We you know, we we can shut our minds, and we can and we can be stubborn. Uh, uh, you know, because that's just human nature to do so. And the next thing is in John 4:48. Jesus said unto him, "Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe." So, uh, demanding signs and wonders uh, is it is, is is you know. Is, a, is, a, is a, almost an immaturity. We want to be entertained. We want to be awed. We want to be kind of persuaded into belief, okay, where Jesus wants us to make intentional, willful decisions regarding believing in him. We would kind of like to be moved, and that's what the world likes, of course, is it wants to be moved and persuaded. And, and so we, uh, you know, we, we uh, um, and, that, and I see that as the, you know, the second type of the parable, the soils, that rocky soil. So in, you know, initially that word is received with great deal of enthusiasm, but the growth is not sustainable because that soil is rocky, right? So there's no depth of growth for the, for the plant, you know, for the word in that, in that type of heart. And then it eventually, it, you know, the, the, the seed withers because, because the soil doesn't have the depth for it to root in. And so that, that's kind of that emotional, you know, that emotional response that ultimately uh, cannot sustain belief. And one that you're all familiar with is John 5:44. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So, of course, there's always, and this is very evident with the Pharisees, with the religious people in Jesus' time, is that they were, they were sensitive to the opinions of others, especially of their group. Right, and uh, once again, that is a common liability we all have. We all want to kind of put our finger to the wind and, and see which way public opinion is blowing. And of course, public opinion is never blowing in the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ or in the way of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so that is something we all need to be aware of: is 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 kind of you know seeing seeing what people are doing. And a lot of uh, church policies, are, of course, are built on on popular vote and not on scripture. And that's what, by the grace of God, makes this church different from a lot of churches. Who, who are frankly political in their in their way of conducting business, so so we we um, you know we need to be careful. We need to be aware of that, and that's you know that's a struggle. You know when you when you witness when you when you evangelize is that you know that you're going against popular opinion when you when you when you present the gospel to human beings, and and there is going to be a reaction against that in in many cases. All right. So the you know the this is the problem the Pharisees had. You know they they were interested in their in their in their status and in, and in the authority that it gave them. They were they were interested in as Jesus said the greetings in the marketplace. That was what was important to them, and that's what kept them from believing in Jesus Christ and accepting Him and as as their Lord and their Savior. All right. John five forty six and forty seven, which I've I think I've already mentioned. He says. Um, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father as the one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? 
All right. So as we mentioned before, having refused truth, there's no opportunity to receive further truth. So we need to be careful that we don't deny the truth we have because that will certainly keep us from receiving further truth because truth builds on itself. Old Testament passages, line upon line, precept upon precept. You build truth, right? You don't, it's, it's, truth has to be established upon, again, upon a framework and added to. But once we, once we undermine that framework by removing truth or, or, or disavowing the truth we have, then we don't leave ourselves a structure in which to build truth upon. Okay, and the final thing in this matter is, um, is his miracles. Again, so he had done mer- many miracles before them, but they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who has believed our report? And of course that verse goes on, but that's the issue, is that he had done the works, he had done the miracles, and they, they had denied the veracity. Remember, they tried, they tried extremely hard to deny the blind man, that the blind man had been healed, the lame man had been given the ability to walk. And they, would have, they wanted to put Lazarus to death, right? That they said, we gotta get rid of this guy because he's living, living breathing testimony of the power of Jesus Christ. All right, so refusing evidence that is, um, that is presented. Now the world, the world would tell us that being skeptical is, is being intelligent, right? That, that we should be skeptical. But when it comes to the things of Jesus Christ, there's no, skepticism is, is again, is, is willfulness. It is, it is, it is not, is not admirable. So, so we need to be willing to believe what Jesus Christ has said because he has the works to, to back up his statements. Um, the next thing is, what are the outcomes of believing in Jesus Christ? What, what is it, you know, what, 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 what are the, the privileges, you will? What are the benefits of it? Uh, in John chapter uh, 1, verse 12, it says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, so we know that, that so, so if, we, if we are the sons of God, it means, of course, we have a place with God. And we have a heritage with God, so that's that's what it means to be a son. So we all we have our fathers. You know, we, we have a place in our fathers' homes. You know, we and, and and we have you know when our fathers pass on out of this life, they give us an inheritance. All right. So Jesus said in John fourteen twelve, I go to my fa- in my father's house. There are many mansions. A, w- a well known verse, and I go to prepare a place for you. If I, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He said. So, so Jesus makes promises to us as sons of God, and those promises we, we claim not because, not because we're eligible for them, but because he has made us, by belief, sons of God. The next thing, of course, is, is the well-known verses in John 13, 15, and 16. We have everlasting life and eternal life. So this is, again, is life that is both inexhaustible and imperishable. That's a promise to those who believe in Jesus Christ. So you, you believe in Jesus Christ, you have a life that transcends this earthly life, transcends the limitations of this life, the duration of the life on earth. In John 5, 24, uh, it says, Verily, verily, I say to you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Now, the great thing about that verse, of course, it is true today. It, it's not waiting for a future fulfillment. We have a light. We have already passed from death to life. That's already a, a fact. We, you know, we are with Jesus Christ has taken us in a sense to heaven with Him. You know, when He was resurrected, we are we are with Him, and as we were with Him, identify with His death, we're identified with His resurrection. So we have passed from death to life. We already are in possession of a life that cannot be extinguished. All right. So, so, so again, that's a confidence living on the earth as we as we watch the earth literally die around us. We have eternal life, and we watch also these bodies of ours kind of, kind of wither and die. We, you know, we know that we have a life that 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 will persist beyond that. All right. So, um, uh, Jesus also said, um, "He that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow river, rivers, excuse me, rivers of living water." So we have the ability as believers in Christ to be refreshers of others. You know, that, that water, that outflow of water is not for us, it is for other human beings that we can refresh others. We have a privilege, you know, we're not for ourselves. We are, it's not a fountain reserved for us. We are, a, we are to be a fountain, or we can be a fountain of, of, of refreshment to other human beings in this world by virtue of, of what is it, the life that is in us that, that can be communicated. Jesus said again, um, that I am come a light into the world, that whoever believeth me should not abide in darkness. We talked about this before. So we have this privilege right now, at this time, 
of having illumination, of having, having, the, uh, having the ability to walk through this world, to, to see where we're going, to watch where our steps are going because we have this spiritual light. Uh, there's evidence, you know, there's great darkness and, that, and people are stumbling in that darkness and they're coming, coming to awfully bad conclusions about things based on, you know, because they're in the dark. So, so we have that light and, and, and we have the privilege of communicating the light. Um, Jesus, and also we have the privilege of being loved by the Father. The Father himself loveth you, said the Lord to his disciples, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So as those who believe in Christ, we are, you know, the, the Lord, we know God loves the world, but the believers in Jesus Christ have the spe a special love from God because they believe in him. So we have the privilege of being known of God and loved by him uh, for, because, because we, we are believers in him. Uh, and we also have the privilege in John 17, 21, to be identified with the Father and the Son and with others, with one another in a like belief. Um, he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me through their word. <clears throat> that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So there's, there's a oneness. You know, the, the other thing, I you know, just keep looking at the world. The world desperately wants to come together because it thinks that it has power. This, is, this was the testimony uh, you know, back, back in the book of Genesis when they built, built the tower, right? They were trying to come together and exert themselves, and the world desperately wants to come together and, and exert themselves, but it cannot come together, of course. It's, it's hopelessly fragmented, and, and, and any, any union in the world is of extremely short duration. But we have in Christ, we have a union by virtue of, of, of our like belief, by virtue of the life that is in us and the spirit that is in us. And we, you know, the, even though we have differences, those differences need not be an impediment to that unity. Matter of fact, those differences are opportunities for us to overcome, you know, to come to a better understanding of one another. But, but it's based upon a unity you know, that we have in Jesus Christ in faith. Next thing I want to talk about are the consequences of unbelief. All right, so there are some consequences of unbelief that we are aware of, but, but no, this message wouldn't be complete without saying this. The first one is John chapter 3, uh, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is their condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. All right, so there's, a, there's a, a state of condemnation, which is a present state for human beings. It's not, a future, you know, it's not a future state. It is the present state of everybody who does not believe. You know, so everyone that, that we rub shoulders with every day who is not a believer in Jesus Christ is in a state of, of judgment, of condemnation. Um, a lot of you are familiar with some of the, the – there's a famous Protestant from, from, uh, from two, a couple hundred years ago, Jonathan Edwards, and he wrote very – Articulately on this subject, and and he and, and he, he had a revival. He didn't have it. God had a revival based on this man's preaching, because he talked about the tenuous position that human beings are in in this world. You know, we're literally walking a tightrope. You know, and, and at any time that that rope can snap, and 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 they are falling into their eternal judgment. So it, we do well to think about things like that. It's not something we want to think about, but the reality is that there's there's an awful and and permanent judgment. Uh, condemnation for those who, who, who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, the next thing is that um, he, John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And you know, we, we are aware of the wrath of God. We, we are aware that God destroyed this world with a flood, okay, back in the book of Genesis that he rained destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the scriptures promise us a yet more severe judgment in the future, in, uh, before, you know, in, in the end time on this earth, that, that God, again, is going to come in wrath. And then even worse is a wrath that goes with, e with eternal destruction, the lake of fire in, 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 in Revelation 20. All right, so, so um, God's wrath is implacable upon those who do not believe, okay? So he wants us, the opportunity there is to believe, but the, the failure to, but the consequence of the failure to believe in Jesus Christ is, is, to, is, to, is to be under God's wrath, which, which we have no hope of satisfying, of, of mediating ourselves. And the last point on this matter is John 8, 24. I say unto you, therefore, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So um, if you've been around a length of time, you've, 
you've accumulated some sins, okay? Uh, now in Jesus Christ, those are forgiven, but, but think about the possibility of taking your sins with you into eternity. You know, that's, that's, that to me is an awful thought, that, you know, that, that you know, to, be, to have your sins and to be associated with them, to have that burden as you go into eternity. So we will still possess our sins if we do not believe in Jesus Christ because there is no other provision to separate us from, from our, our iniquities, our trespasses, and our sins against God, but in Jesus Christ and his blood that he shed to atone for us. So if we deny Christ, we have left ourselves no opportunity to, to be parted from our sins, and we take them into eternity. Um, so, so that's that's you know that's a, there is a consequence to unbelief, just as there are benefits to believing. There are consequences to unbelief, and a couple of points I want to make. Uh, what is our command? You have believed. So, what, what are the commandments to those who believe? And I just want to make uh, two points uh, from John eight thirty one and thirty two. It says, "He that uh, as he spake his words, many believed upon him." And Jesus said to those Jews who believed. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So true believers continue in the word of God. They continue in the truth. They continue in the light. They continue to build the framework of understanding that allows them to believe yet more. So believing again is a process. We don't have everything that, that God calls us to believe. We are still, we are still being developed in our beliefs. You know, and, and, but we have a responsibility to be in the Word. In the, in the Word, we have the Word now we need to hear. You know, so, so our responsibility to hear does not end with us coming to a position of belief. The next thing is that, um, with again, back to this, uh, the man who was blind, who was healed, that the Lord came to, um, when, he, when he confessed belief, uh, this man worshiped Christ. So, so God looking for worshipers, right? We know that Jesus spoke that in John chapter 4. The God is seeking those to worship in spirit and truth. And again, it, 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 a, you know, an opportunity we have as believers is to worship God. You know, to, you know, the, those who, we, you know, then God's, God demands that worship be in spirit and in truth. And it is a privilege and, the, and the, the, the sole opportunity of those who believe to worship God in spirit, in spirit and truth. Others cannot. You know, it, it's, it, it might be a hard saying, but others cannot truly worship God if they do not believe because they don't possess the truth. They don't possess, you know, they don't have the, the power of the spirit in them to, to, to affect that worship that, that, that pleases God. Uh, so I want to close with uh, this point that we are accountable for what we believe. I think you know there's a there's a sense in which we want to think, well, I simply believe what I've been exposed to. Uh, but God holds us accountable. You know, we were held, we're held accountable for the choice that we make concerning the information we have, and that uh, believing is a, a volitional choice. It is not something that comes upon us. It is, it is something clearly the Lord called people to back, you know, and still calls people to is to believe. Uh, we, we, uh, we are not passive in this manner. We cannot, in the time of judgment, we cannot say we are victims of our circumstance. Uh, I point you to Romans uh, 1, 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed to have in he from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto him. So we have the privilege of God showing us things, and we, we, have, to, we have to act upon what he has shown us. We, we cannot leave them at arm's length. That is, that is not going to be acceptable to God. That is not going to count for any favor in God's judgment. So believe the truth you have, accept that light, and, and, uh, and, and, and allow, allow that illumination and that truth to be in you. And, uh, and, and, and continue to believe. I, I actually, I, I wanted uh, John, uh, the 1 John 5, 11 and 12, I want to close with here, I think. And this is the record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. He has called us, he has called us to, you know, to believe unto, unto life. And and, uh, and and that's a process that we need to continue in, uh, you know, and, and to continue to share with others. So let's let's pray.